Hello, welcome to another episode of Afikra's Matbakh. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm really excited. Our guest today is somebody whose work I have been I've admired for some time. His name is Nader Nehdi. He's the founder of Benny. He's a presenter, a filmmaker, and producer from London with Yemeni, Indonesian, Pakistani, and Kenyan heritage. Nader was recently voted by the Evening Standard as one of the most influential Londoners. His videos articulate the unique experience of children of the diaspora. Nader, welcome to Matbakh. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. It's amazing to be here. I love the platform. Learned a lot from it myself. Now, we deliberately match today just to let everybody yeah. know that we came with a, with a preconceived plan that we're going to go for a look and it's for the benefit of everyone watching so i hope people appreciate it a lot of thought and effort went behind this black exactly that's gloves. exactly the only difference is i have hair on my face and you have hair on your head <laughs> that's the only difference <laughs> okay in fact, i'm gonna take that off this is a bit uncanny it's like messing me up i don't know which one's me and which one's you <laughs> i know um now that i'm gonna ask you the first question which is um how long did it take for you to be comfortable leading with the sentence that I just led with, which is, I'm a guy from London with Yemeni, Indonesian, Pakistani, and Kenyan heritage. Um, I can imagine that at some points in your childhood, you're like, I cannot be bothered to explain this to people anymore. Uh, when did it become something that you're like, all right, I'll just put it in a quick sentence and it is who I am and let's keep it moving. Yeah, no, great question. I feel like... It was a lot harder in my youth. I think my, a lot of my teenage years and early 20s could be defined by me kind of desperately trying to be accepted by one of these things. And I kind of ebbed and flowed between them. You become this like cultural chameleon in a sense. And that becomes like from when you're born, you have this ability to kind of dip your toe into a cultural reference and then dip out of it. But as a result of that, you're never really fully embraced by any one of them. At least I felt like that. And I think, um, you know, there would be situations where like, cultural it'd be like a merge list and there'd be cultural things happening around me and you know maybe i had a deficiency in language or a cultural, a cultural tradition and felt like i was a kind of observer to what was happening in front of me as opposed to a, part, a participant in it and those those were really difficult as a young so you know we're always constantly seeking like validation from elders and peers and people we look up to and i think in my context it was definitely a need to be culturally accepted in one of these things and like I was deeply insecure about my deficiency in the languages and like in cultural references. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of culture in the house. So of course, one of them is going to like be less influential than the other. Um, it wasn't until I grew older and I had a higher sense of self and lots of self work that you start to realize really that the only validation you need is yourself and you grow up. And I think a lot of us kind of learn that in different reference with regards to our lives with me, I learned that like, I would never feel like I belonged if I was always comparing myself to how others reference their culture to themselves. And I just accepted that, look, look, I am something different, new, refreshing, and I can feel, I can be partly something, but feel, feel it fully. And once I kind of really like understood what that meant for myself, it opened up. I, I, I feel like it's my superpower now. Like, I feel like you know, I feel like I have access and I feel like I have exposure to so many different cultural references, whereas some people might have one. And as a result of that privilege, and I consider it a privilege, like, you know, I'm I'm more well-rounded as an individual. I feel like I have a natural openness to other things that are outside my reference. I feel like I can easily, I'm, I call it cultural mobility. You can kind of, you understand what's happening around you in a cultural sense. And it's really defined my work in life. And like, um, but it came with time as with anything in life. Um, and it's only probably in the last three, like, yeah, maybe five-ish years where I felt like I really owned it for myself. Yeah, I like that idea of cultural mobility. It's something that's like, um, in so many ways, I feel like London is a one of one. Um, yeah. Do you feel like growing up in London, that this idea of cultural mobility, you just had so many reps at it? Because, yeah. I mean, it's like not even neighborhood to neighborhood, it's street to street, right? 100%. I feel like the cliche London story, <laughs> actually, uh, some people some people get angry at me for saying this, but I feel like London is the center of the world. Yes, it might have happened because of very negative and like terrible historical historical circumstances. But as a result of that, like everyone is here. And I feel like London really was the only city that could house these cultures that I was part of in one place. And like, 
you know, I would go to the Middle East and like there wasn't as much diversity as I would have experienced in London or whether it was Indonesia or Pakistan or Kenya. It was very different. But in London, everyone was there and I could like feel um, part of all of them at the same time. London is different to New York, for example. New York, yes, you could argue is a very diverse city, but not as well integrated. Communities are very kind of fractured fractured and even architecturally the city kind of is quite divisive um, but London it's like you grew up and you know for example Kensington the most expensive neighborhood in London is also home to some of the worst housing estates in the city so there's proximity to people of different class and culture yes of course people are very different but as long as you're exposed to people who are different from you you have to have like an acumen you have to have a means of like understanding how to treat people talk to people outside of your echo chamber or your bubble. Um, but yeah, um, London is a special place and I do believe, and I'm a staunch Londoner, and I do believe it's the most diverse, beautiful capital in the world. And I'll I'll, I'll defend that. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. I mean, I, I've never lived in London. My brother lives there. Um, and so I've been there a bunch and it does feed, feel decidedly different from other global capitals. Um, and especially very different than uh, the Arab world. I mean, this is a conversation that's happening on Africa. So the, the the framework is really focused on the history and culture of the Arab world. I'm curious about your, I mean, uh, part of your family and part of you is, is Yemeni. What is the Yemeni community like in London? I mean, like what, how is that community kind of different than maybe other communities there Um yeah, no, Does that make sense? I mean, because I feel like in Brooklyn, the Yemeni community in Brooklyn is very, very specific and it feels a little different. Um, yes. Well, the American Yemeni community is incredible. Like, yeah. actually, that's one of the things I love the most about going to like the States is just to see like how many Yemenis are there and how entrenched they are into like the society and cultural fabric there. But in the UK is very different. <laughs> well, London is very different. There isn't a huge community in London. Um, actually, the first Yemenis that arrived in the country came as a result of when Aden was the capital of the colonial region in South Asia, um, a lot of the Yemenis came as Lascars, they were called. They were they were worked on sailboats, they worked on colonial military. They came and docked in places like Cardiff and, and Liverpool, and some of them stayed there. Some of them were granted like freedom of passage and movement. They stayed, they created communities there. So you have very historical entrenched Yemeni communities in the port cities of the UK. Um, and I go there and it's massive. There are loads of Yemenis there, but London didn't benefit from that transaction. So there aren't many Yemeni restaurants. There aren't many entrenched communities in, in, in London, ironically. But you go to Cardiff and these are people who um, have been there for a very long time, longer actually than some Yemeni communities in the States. A lot of these communities are mixed. They're half Welsh. A lot of them are kind of half British. They've been there so long. They've integrated into kind of broader society as a whole. Um, and the cultures are incredibly interesting because there's a word for it. I'm thinking about it in the context of the Cape Malay people when you've been taken out of a cultural framework and then put somewhere halfway across the world and then your culture kind of still grows and develops and forms, but outside the nucleus of the main home, yeah, it develops yeah. into something unique and different. Um, and that's what you can see in the Yemeni communities here. They're rooted in that same source but they have kind of developed in this very unique British kind of way. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Of so so many migrant communities, like um, communities that leave in like the 1800s and they're in some, you know, they're in Kansas City and all of a sudden it's like they've spun off and created this like parallel mm. pipeline. Um, in our first conversation, when I spoke to you, I was like, hey, I definitely want to interview you on Afikra and I'm thinking of having you on Matbakh. Um, because that's kind of my entry point into your work. You're like, Mikey, I'm not a chef. I, I need to put that out there. Um, what is your relationship to food? Because so much of the sort of the content and the work that I've seen you do is like, I don't know, food adjacent is the right word, but it's through the lens of food. Um, but you were just, you were like, I, I, I want to make sure this is appropriate. It's, it's you know, yeah. so I, I want to understand your relationship to food and sort of your relationship to the food world and why there was that. that yeah, um, bro. I mean, like, you were like, this Matfak series, there's some serious chefs there. And I was like, <laughs> oof, I don't know if I feel comfortable being like side by side with some of these incredible talented chefs who dedicated their whole lives 
to this passion. But then when you kind of, uh, you described it to me, it kind of made sense. My relationship yeah. with food, that like, I loved it. And like I said, you referenced my multicultural kind of history as a, as a youngster. You know, I was constantly looking for vehicles to tap into my culture, right? What were these things? What were these verticals in which I could have a window into my culture and feel more part of it? Language was one, was a deep access and a key into like a cultural reference. But then there's also food. Food was a huge vehicle for me to understand or feel like I belonged to a certain cultural um, <laughs> identity. Um, and where I might have felt deficient in language in some places, I might have compensated with food. And like, there's this idea that I've kind of been playing with um, recently is about the idea of being fluent in flavor, right? And especially for a lot of diasporic people from the Middle East, a lot of us have been detached from our homelands and our heritage. What we're looking for is like anchors to feel kind of still relatively rooted in places of our heritage. And food is one of the first bastions of that, right? And like, you know, we talk about food having the ability to tell stories. We kind of understand it as a means to kind of bring people together. But really, like, what does that mean on a granular level? Like, if we consider the food of our heritage as our ancestors cooking with the ingredients around them. So literally, they've cooked food as a result of the produce they are growing around them. So things we grew up eating, whether it's the lebne or the msakhan or it's the zurbian or whether it's the mendi, these are dishes that have been nurtured, developed, created as a result of their given environment. If there is anything more indicative of who we are or our identity or, or, or us as people, it's the food that we grew up eating. And I think when you've been taken away from that environment, it's such an easy, powerful and accessible way to kind of remind yourself of who you are and where you come from. And a lot of these dishes have stories, like stories we would never even imagine that they have. And I love kind of like learning about them but also reminding us, like, not not to make us feel like, oh my God, we need to go back to our roots and like, you know, be really like stagnant in that cultural heritage. But yes, we're moving towards a future that is incredibly uncertain and we're developing our heritage to mean new things in the future. But if we're rooted in where these things came from, I really feel like that future will be a lot more kind of beautiful and incredible. And food for me is a very powerful means to do that because we all eat. We all love to eat. We all love to share food. You know, one of the craziest thing is, is, you know, I wasn't, food wasn't always one of my main things that I did. But when I started posting food videos, all these like white people started following me. And I was like, this is crazy. I was like, usually when a white person would follow me on my social media account, I thought it was like, okay, a marketing exec. Maybe it was like a social media rep for like a brand and they wanted to work with me. Usually there was a professional transaction, but I started posting food and people from outside my cultural reference um, started following me. And like, I was like, this is insane. Like food has provided an accessible medium for them to hear my story so that they can empathetically engage with who I am better. And like as a vehicle, that was incredibly powerful to me. And like, I might not be the best chef, but I feel like I have great stories. So like, that was the kind of log like the, the, the philosophy or the reasoning behind really leveraging yeah. into that. All right. So like, let's say 10 years ago, me and you met at like a, a dinner party or at a coffee shop. And I was like, um, Nadir, what do you do 10 years ago? Is ten food years. in that is is food in that paragraph about what do you do? Like what do you do? If, if we spoke ten years ago, what would you have said? I mean, if you want to get like everything apart, it defines my day. Like food yeah. for me was like part of my lived experience. <laughs> when I travel, it's like I don't travel to see the Eiffel Tower. I travel because I know there's a great restaurant there, or there's a great community cooking this kind of food. Like food is part of my conscious decision making every single day. Like, so it's it's a massive factor in my life. If I'm going to meet you and you come to London, for example, the first thing I'm stressing out about is like, what does this guy like to eat? What is the best place I know that we can go to, etc. So it is part of what I do, but now it's just become part of what I professionally do, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. And to be able to mesh a passion and something I feel very close to with what I do is incredible. The reason why I ask is because I'm always interested in the way things, um, the way certain strands of people's personalities expand or contract over time. Mm. And, and sort of the trigger is, that allow for that expansion or contraction. Mm. 
And so like the latent interest has been there clearly your entire life. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about like what parts of your professional life expanded or contracted to make way for that, um, yeah, yeah. that sort of takeover, you know what I mean? No, great question. I think, I think it got to an age where like I'd learned enough, I'd experienced enough. I started to see like correlations between these foods. And I think like, it was like, hold on a minute. I know this flavor. I know this ingredient, but this is not the culture that I usually reference it to. And like what I started to realize was like, there's more similarities between my cultures than I previously thought. And then you start looking into that and you see that historically, actually, it's not very weird to be a Yemeni, Indonesian, Kenyan, Pakistani. I'm literally like a child of the Indian Ocean, right? And these communities and these cultures have been communicating for the last hundreds of years. So actually, it's only weirdly now when identity has become like a thing for it to be strange to be mixed at this to this level when really people have been intermingling for generations. And I learned that through foods and whether it was the spices used or learning that Yemeni traders who settled in Indonesia, who took their spice up to like South Asia and then colonialism and how it spread those spices around the world, forced my ancestors to move across the world. Food was literally the front lines in which allowed me to exist today and like I, I learned that delving deeper into like the genesis of certain spices and certain dishes and that was really like eye-opening for me yeah it's interesting so as you were as as that sentence was coming out of your mouth I was like oh my god of course because there's there's this idea of centering regions and cultures not around continents not around lands but around the water yes um, exactly. and so like once you think about entire spaces revolving around water, uh, waterways, as opposed to land masses, all of a sudden you start seeing the world really, really differently. It's like, it's like flipping into dark mode, you know, like on your Chrome, <laughs> like all of a sudden you're like, Oh, this, this is interesting. This looks different. Um, but okay. So give me a couple examples because like that region that you just outlined, right. if you think about it from the, like, a man, I believe Empire, that it's beautiful. Like, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, like, absolutely, that's totally right. Like, and, and it's, it's a beautiful thought because water is literally like a source of life, right? And if you start viewing the world and people being communicated by this body of life, then beautiful. And like, you know, when I tell people, oh, I feel like I'm a child of the Indian Ocean, people think I'm a bit weird. And it's a very hippie thing to say, but like, it makes total sense to me. Like people, this water, this body of warm water was a means for people to communicate, to exchange ideas, food, spices, um, and it wasn't novel to them. In fact, actually, there are communities that are literally, for example, my Kenyan family are Swahili, which is very different to like mainland Kenyan families. Cultures. In fact, coastal Swahili culture pe people have more in common with South Asians and like Sumatran Indonesian people because these, this coast is a connection. Like you said, once you start seeing people as being connected as a result of body of water, culturally, there's more cultural exchanges than they would have had with people in the mainland. And that is an, an interesting thought in itself is that people can be divided by states or huge distances, but water actually is a means for them to share a lot more than we previously thought. And yeah. Yemenis were the best at that, bro. Like, like Yemenis are literally everywhere you go. <laughs> they are the most like uh, entrepreneurial merchant community of, of, of just entrepreneurs that went all over the world, Indonesia, South Asia. They went all the way to East Africa. Like these people integrated within these coastal communities so well. And as a, as a result, had a huge influence on other cultures as well. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's so obvious. It's it's, it's uh, hiding in plain sight. So I'm so happy you brought that up. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot. This is something I didn't ask. I didn't tell you. I want to speak to you about. Can you give us a, a, a couple examples of like spices or foods that are are examples of that those waterways? You know that that spice trade where you're like, oh, obviously this isn't. I would I would taste this in. Jakarta and Goa and and uh, Zanzibar and uh, uh, Yemen and like what are some examples that are like found across all these different places that might surprise people? Absolutely, I mean, there's two. There's like a negative and a positive because a lot of these exchanges happen as a lot of negative impact as well, right? 
And that's important to identify as like huge cataclysmic historical moments can like also give birth to some of the most amazing food, which is a bit of an irony and paradox as well. But a positive example is cloves. Cloves were a very highly sought for spice in Indonesia, unique to that region. Um, and Yemeni merchants would come and they would trade silks and other things that they had kind of gathered from other parts of the world for cloves. Cloves made it back to Hadramaut. And as a result of that, we have cake lapis, which is this layered cake, which actually the Yemenis took from Indonesia. We have palau, like Yemeni, like a, it's a clove-based biryani, basically. Um, and you see in Yemeni cuisine, a lot of cloves being used, which isn't organic or isn't, you, you know, the part of the given environment in Southern Yemen. Um, and that is a beautiful exchange happening because it gave birth to a huge Hadrami cuisine, which is so much more varied and diverse as a result of the spices that were taken out of Indonesia. But then you have negative ones, like, for example, coffee. Coffee, which was exclusively grown in Yemen, which is a huge part of the national identity. The Dutch managed to st steal a coffee bean or coffee seed, pardon me. They took it to Indonesia. They cultivated it there. They literally took the Arabica bean, gave birth to the Java bean, which was a derivative of the original Yemeni coffee. And as a result of that, completely decimated the Yemeni market for coffee. And coffee, as a result, spread around the world. But as we can see, like we these communities can have very positive and also negative impacts as they kind of interact and communicate with one another um but those two examples are, are, are perfectly positioned to show you that there was a lot of um, interaction between the two both positive and negative yeah the coffee the coffee story is is like so interesting at one point um like last year, I was talking to my dad and we we're trying to, we we're discussing World War II and we we're like, why did Japan go into World War II again? Like, we're trying to figure this out. And then we're like, oh yeah, Indonesia and Europe and controlling uh, that entire space. And it's crazy. Um, yeah, so, yeah go ahead. No, it's, cra it's, it's crazy. And like, it was a very fertile part of the world. And like, um, you know, one thing I have to say about Yemenis is like the manner in which they conducted their like, affairs or businesses or merchant dealings they it was slow historically it was very like they ingratiated themselves culturally within the people and there was a natural kind of harmony there as opposed to a extractive um, um nature but then colonialism comes completely decimates that natural harmony that was taking place within the indian ocean and as a result like it just completely destroyed these heritage and traditional ways in which people used to deal with one another and grow spices, etc. And it reminds me of Avatar. We've all seen Avatar. Literally, it's so triggering to watch because like, if you consider people growing these spices as a means of livelihood, it's literally a life force for them, right? And then this big scary colonial comes and literally extracts it, destroys it, decimates it so you can't grow it again. Um, <laughs> And extracts extreme wealth from it. And as a result, the people are left with like very little. And uh, communities are still kind of um, recovering from that. Like Ye Yemeni coffee is making a resurgence now. But as a result of that, God took over. And like, you know, the drugs and different types of um, less beneficial things were grown as a result of the void that coffee created. And so, yeah, communities are still recovering to this day. Yeah. I want to ask you about... Um... When I introduced you, I was like, um, I said that you were the founder of Benny. Mm -hmm. What is Benny? Please explain this to our listeners. Okay, so the Benny, the name, it sounds really holier than thou. It's not as holier than thou than it, than it sounds. <laughs> 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 but it was one of those like transcendental moments where I was like, damn, oh, wow, that's powerful. So I was actually a, I was actually a, everyone's going to think I'm a really good wholesome Muslim boy, mashallah. Um, I was like praying my Jummah prayers and I was, you know, re, I was reading some Quran and then I came across this passage in which God metaphorically refers to mankind as Benny Adam, right? And I was like, Benny Adam. I was like, I love that because it's not really divisive in terms of, it doesn't refer to you with ethnicity in mind, nationality, color of skin. It was a very generic term that referred to mankind as a whole and, allowed a sense of community within that and I was looking for a name for something at that time and then I was like Benny Adam Benny Adam and then I was like my whole thing is that I don't really know where I'm from I'm trying to be part of something but not really part of anything so then Benny hyphen took the Adam out so it, was, it translated really it means like people of question mark people of children of question mark 
And then I just like registered, registered it right there and there in the mosque. And it kind of went with it. It made sense in my head, but I think actually weirdly it's resonated with some people. So um, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful story. I hadn't heard that story before. Um, as a, as a, um, and from the jump, it was like, okay, this is going to be a, a home for storytelling. And this is going to be a home for um, your pursuit of like understanding basically the world. Yeah, absolutely. So like, like there's two things basically just to kind of break it down very, very, very yeah. simply. There's me, Nadir, the personality. So like the individual and what I do is very separate to like what Benny does. Benny is more of a community platform. And the idea behind Benny is like, it's so much more bigger than me. But we live in a world today that you have to leverage the personality to get anything seen. And this is the sad reality of the world is I have been born and raised by community. My parents were activists and I understood the need for it. So I felt really passionate about creating a space for that. But I also understand realistically that we're growing up in a very hedonistic, narcissistic world where people don't trust faceless platforms anymore, where like, you know, news has let people down. Instead, they're looking for personalities to latch their trust to people they identify with, people who they feel like maybe they can hang out on a Friday night with. So um, I decided to like lean into that and like, be okay, cool. Like there's Nader and this is me and what I do as a presenter. And then there's Benny, which is the creative platform where we or we organize events, we produce content and um, also create products, social enterprise products. And the idea behind it is kind of, I always saw it as a culture lab for innovative ideas, but how are we as a generation of people who are third cultural, but maybe you're also children of diaspora, how are we creating this new culture? And it's really important for me to say is that people just, you know, when I talk about identity and I talk about culture, it's not because I'm infatuated by it. In fact, actually, I actually believe if we obsess on identity, it limits our identity. I really believe that in the future that we are going to have to navigate unprecedented times and circumstances. But we as people who are multi-hyphenated and, um, you, know, uh, you know, we amalgamate different experiences, we are perfectly placed to start building the foundations of what this new identity, this new heritage looks like in the future. And I really wanted to be part of that future conversation. I didn't want to get stuck in the past, the golden age of this, or this is what it means to be like culturally Lebanese and let's hold on to this. And like, what does it mean to like push that into the future and being like, okay, like, yes, heritage was built at some point. What's the heritage we're building for our descendants in the future? And that's the space and the questions that I wanted to navigate. So Benny's part of that. And like, it kind of happens in those, in very various forms and, and, and formats. Do you feel like you have to have different versions of this conversation um, in different diasporic spaces? Like, because you yeah. sort of, um, because you, for the nature of your work and the nature of your, your family, float in and out of different places. Do you feel like the types, the 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 versions and flavors of this conversation vary slightly or differ slightly if you're speaking um, to a diaspora community that is largely East African or a diaspora uh, community that is largely South Asian or you know Southeast Asian. Does it feel <clears throat> like it's there are differences that I, Mikey, may not expect? That's a great question. Um... Less than you think. And I think actually being mixed, I've I've grown up realizing this, right? Like there were things that happening in my Yemeni culture, things that were happening in my Indonesian culture, which cosmetically were a bit different on a very granular level. But really they're rooted in the same thing. Usually it's family, faith, tradition, um, preserving certain things. So the foundations are identical. And I noticed this within all the cultures that I was part of. But what differs is really decorative. It's the specific granular things that we become attached to. So there is a pan-diasporic conversation, which I feel is so important to have, especially in a world that's like increasingly globalized. And a lot of us are living in these hyper-diverse cities. You know, we also live in a mad, mad politically hostile environment right now. It's insane. Like, you know, a lot of my friends like don't even want to raise children in the environment that we live in today. So this is why I feel like these conversations are so important because as we retreat into our cultural silos out of suspicion or fear, because the world has created this really hostile environment, there's very little like communication that's happening between people who are seemingly different. And that makes me very sad. And like why it triggers me is because like I would never be on this planet if there wasn't some sort of compassion between people who are different. 
you know, my grandparents are all mixed. I'm a result of people talking and engaging with people who are culturally different to them. Yeah. And I feel like, I like to think I turned out all right. And I really feel like if more thing, if more people and more communities realized that there's more that brings them together than arbitrary differences, then the world would be a better place for it. Yeah. Somebody who was a big proponent of that, obviously, was Bourdain. And I love that in your um, in your Instagram uh, profile, you have wannabe Brown, <laughs> Brown Bourdain. You're referring to, of course, the incredible uh, food writer and uh, um, traveler extraordinaire, Anthony Bourdain, uh, who passed away at this point, probably like 12 years ago, 15 years ago. I'm not, I, uh, I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, when, uh, so what about, what about Anthony Bourdain um, gives you the sort of the, um, the desire to sort of tap into his spirit? I think there was an unabashedness. There was an unapologeticness. There was a kind of asshole tendency, but with a deep, deep gentleness as well. And I think like, I loved that. I loved, I loved that someone could cut through the shit, pardon, pardon my French, but like, but get to the crux of what needed to be said. And, you know, we live in such a kind of, you know, everything is gray. Everything is like, for someone to morally be like, this is what is right. And this is what is wrong. Go into a politically complex environment and actually see truth and morally what is the right thing to do was really like refreshing for me. It was like, He's not trying to pander to other people, but he sees things for what they are within his given moral fabric. And for me, I loved that. It was just like, it was so, un- it was just unabashed. And I, I love that he just turned the whole kind of TV food space on its head. And as a result of that, he allows so many more people like access to these worlds, which they previously wouldn't have, wouldn't have had. And look, I, I love people, man. I honestly, like, I, I just love traveling. I love meeting people. I love learning about things that I, I had no idea about before. So I'm really passionate about that. And he was kind of one person who I felt like connected with so many different kinds of people. And that's the energy I try to channel in my work also. You know, it's funny, like somebody like Bourdain, I always felt like he kind of tapped into this idea that's like, I feel like in, in some ways there are these two two types of people, right? Mm. There are people who love humanity, but hate humans. Yeah, yeah. And there are people who love humans, but hate humans. Humanity. Yeah, exactly. yeah, hundred percent. Are like disgusted with humanity, but they love humans. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's why he's the perfect story. He himself yeah. is a story, right? Like you're yeah. you're seeing this old stubborn man kind of unfold through his like very tender moments with people, and um, that's really beautiful to see. And like uh, to, you know, throughout his career on TV, you you see him grow as an individual, and it was very compelling. And I think a lot of us resonate with that because it was so very human, right? Like. Like, yeah, F the world. All of us have had moments like that where the world just feels like a really shitty place. And like, but it takes one moment of like a shared dinner with someone like who you, you know, maybe it's a vulnerable moment and food yeah. is the vehicle to kind of like just have a bit more faith in the world today. I want to talk about that cynicism for a second, if, sure. if you'll allow me. This, this might overstep a little bit, but yes, if you'll permit I'm me. Like, Mix it up, Mikey. Make it yeah, controversial. <laughs> make it controversial. I mean, I mean, Anthony Bourdain um, died very tragically. Um, and I feel like it's hard to intro- it's hard to do what you do. It's hard to be a public mm-hmm. face um, without having to sort of introduce a degree of cynicism that allows you to sort of to, you know, like front the work, right? It's yeah. it's easier. I mean, my approach to things is, I think it is like safer. <laughs> There's like, I'm like always trying to hide away from it. Um, Cause quite frankly, it just scares me. Yeah. How do you deal with that fear? Like I, it, for me, it, it scares the bejesus out of me. I'm just, I'm scared by it. Like. <laughs> yeah, man, and it terrifies me. Like till this day, I think uh, what I'm realizing is that I'm only getting like, bigger and bigger and the pitfalls with that is getting worse and worse so and the things that you have to compromise and 
sacrifice are getting more and more as I kind of enter this world more more as, as my life progresses. And it is terrifying. What are we talking about specifically? We're talking about like an invasion of privacy. We're talking about a deep lack of trust with people, people you know very well, but also people you don't know at all. Um, we're talking about people maybe really wanting to exploit you and your voice and what you stand for. And also there's something about our people. And I say our people in a very generic sense that we love our rags to riches story, but the only story we love more than that is a riches to rags story. Yeah. And like people have got you on their crosshairs because maybe you come across as a half decent person. The only way to validate themselves and their insecurities is by invalidating someone else. So they're waiting for you to put one foot wrong. Like they're waiting for you to like say something that maybe you shouldn't have said. So you always feel like you're on like eggshells and like it is a terrifying thing. How do I kind of survive in it? Is that I like, it also is an incredibly rewarding thing that I do. Like I have access to life in which like, you know, maybe not many people have or, or, or stories and experiences that really are so nourishing and like formative to me and myself, Nader, that I'm, I'm really dedicated to. Um, I also feel like I just, I think you have to have a personality like, like when something terrifies me, I'm the kind of person that will just run forward like run straight to it um and that's the kind of person i am i feel the only way for me to get over that anxious feeling which is which i constantly have in it is to just do it even more go ahead keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it and i might mess up along the way but it's the only way to get over over the worst feeling i feel which is regret um so it's about a hierarchy of emotions that i would rather feel or not feel um yeah but yeah it was is your tough. family ever was your family ever being like now they pump the brakes on the on the um you know personality thing persona thing were they ever just like oh well my, my, my parents interestingly were like kind of influencers before social media were a thing so they were very yeah. public people within the community so like you know they worked in kind of politics and activism and um it, within a british context so i grew up with them feeling like very public people everywhere we go people would be like now your Fuad Nahdi's son or your american son whatever yeah so they understand the world they get it they entirely get it and like all the challenges that they had i've kind of or i've learned as a result of observing them have kind of trickled into my work also um but you know, you know, we were talking before and I was just yeah. telling you how important the work that a, a Fikra is. But bro, like I truly feel that you're on this world for like a reason, right? And like a Fikra is like hard work, right? If this was done because it was a job, a Fikra would have died three, four years ago. But it's being done because there are people who truly believe that there is a well of cultural knowledge and history within the Middle East that people don't have access to that they should do. And you believe in that. And I know you do. And I know the whole team does. And that's why it's surviving and doing really well. And I believe also that I've been put on this. One of the things that I've had to accept through various therapies and whatever is that, alhamdulillah, God has given me certain gifts, right? I talk a certain way. I look a certain way. I have access to life in a certain way. The bigger crime to me would be to not honor those gifts in which God has given me and do the best I can within that. And like, if I can help some people along the way, amazing. Like, but the worst thing would be to cower in a kind of anxiety induced fear um, and regrets. But I feel like I really lean into that sense of purpose. And like, this is my purpose in life. I truly feel it. Um, and yeah, hopefully like it benefits some people along the way. Yeah, you gotta shape what God gave you. Hmm. Yeah, um, I believe in that, man. I'm like this, I believe in that whole spiritual, universal, transcendental stuff. And we're all here for a reason. It might be big or small or perceivably big or small, but we will have purpose. Yeah, no, I I, I appreciate that for sure. Um, okay, I want to ask you, I want to switch back to food stuff for a second. Um, for those listening to the podcast, I have on the screen uh, this uh, post of yours from Instagram. And the top line says, Andalusian lamb shank. And the bottom line says the fall of Andalusia. Right. Um, I'm curious, walk us through how those two things are connected and like how you approach your content, how you think about your content as opposed to just being like, all right, this is just a, um, this is just, you know, you mix in this amount of lime and you do this and you add this amount of oregano and you add this and you preheat this. Like, how do you think through this stuff where history and food interact? Yeah, no, good question. So the thinking behind this is, um, 
Andalusia. And the big, they're actually very technical. So the bigger writing is going to be, oh, like amazing, delicious food. And then the kind of jab is like, oh, take some history about the fall of Andalusia along the way. So there is, there is a thinking of like baits. Oh, this sounds really delicious. Uh, take this with you along the way. That's and the I felt fortune, like fortune cookie model. Exactly. And if you did it in the inverse, I promise you, I promise you people will be less interested. So if it said the fall of, in, uh, the fall of Andalusia, Oh, the recipe of an Andalusian lamb shine. People wouldn't be interested. Honestly, primarily, I think people come because the food looks amazing and it's shot in a certain way and, and they're really curious about the lamb shank. But then people are stay because of the story and the history involved. So like these videos can be very technical and there's a lot of thought put into it. And like, for example, you watch one of my videos in the first five seconds, I know that like people in their 20s have like a five second attention span. So like... The, those first five seconds need to be dynamic. I'm going to tell you exactly what this video is about. It's going to be amazing. And then we're going to get into it. And this is the key for storytelling right now is like, you know, food is a medium for me to tell a story, but it's also not good enough just to have a great story. It's also how we tell it. There's so much empathy. There's so much, not empathy, sorry, apathy. There's so much content in the world today that people just feel like turning off around it. I know for myself, I'm just like scrolling and flicking, but really what sticks out is the kind of innovative ways we are telling these stories. And for me, I will pick on a dish, in this case, Andalusia, I will pick, pick on a dish that looks incredible, that people will have a curiosity about what culture could possibly give birth to like a dish like this. And, um, and, and I'll tell you their history along the way. And it's really worked really well, bro. These videos have done like ins like insanely well, and people really deeply resonate with it. Um, and I'm really I'm really passionate about finding really like engaging, innovative ways to tell similar stories. The Palestine one, for example, was like blew people's mind. Right, we did a video on um, the Jaffa cakes, which I grew up with. So I'm British, born and raised in London. Jaffa cakes we grew up with, right? This is the one, yeah. And Never in my life did I ever think Jaffa referred to Jaffa in Philistine. Never in my life. Literally, I was about 30 years old when I found out, right? Um, and I went into this wormhole. You, you know, some Palestinian friends were telling me, actually, did you know that it was based on the Jaffa orange, which was like, you know, a, a Palestinian through and through orange. It got taken by the, Brit the British. They took it to the UK, created a cake out of it. Um, and it blew my mind because now the same orange farms are in occupied territory. So there's your in. It's like, wow, did you know contentious history, occupied lands? It was a Palestinian orange, but it's not considered Palestinian anymore because it was taken away from them. Um, and we've created a paradoxically beautiful Jaffa cake in the pro process. All of that in conjunction really kind of creates a compelling video. It's the weird paradox of a beautiful food and haunting history. And it's like, how can something so tasty and beautiful also be a result of quite a traumatic past at the same time? And that really fascinates me, this kind of oxymoron uh, yeah. of storytelling. Is it, um, when you first started making this content, was it just you or has it, I, I, I'll actually, uh, I'll show my hand. I don't know the answer to this question at all. Like, are you this multi, uh, armed octopus who's shooting it and editing and doing everything at this point? Well, these videos, yes. So like I, I have teams that come in and out depending on the projects, but these were passion projects, these videos. Yeah. And I was like, mm. and you, you, what you do is that you kind of create like a, a beta or a, a pilot. So these videos were basically pilots of like, I have this idea of reels, one minute 30, you're going to tell a history story, but really compelling and fast. And they're about food history that people had no idea about. So you have to do it yourself because it's a passion yeah. project. There's no one, no one's funded it, whatever. Also, as soon as you get someone to fund it, which would have been easy for me to do, by the way, um, the voice becomes distorted. Do you think, uh, do you think any brand, do you think Jaffa or McVitsey's would have allowed me to talk about the Palestinian origins of like Jaffa cakes? Hell no. And for me, the clarity of my voice and the authenticity of that history was really important to me. So there are some things which I just have to do myself. And that's where the passion work, the hard work comes in and, these videos are, are, are definitely part of that. And I feel really, I will not work with a brand unless I get to say what I want to say. Um, and, um, but yeah, it's me in a corner of my house where there's some amazing natural light, set it up. It's like vertical. The whole house is like a, like a, a mess, a total mess, except for this perfect vertical, which is very curated <laughs> and cooking in stages. And then you like, you're shooting and then you run into the shot, you pour the chocolate, run back, 
change the angle, close. It takes a whole day. It's a nightmare, to be honest with you. I don't think actually people realize actually how hard these are to shoot. So what what aspect of that shooting process do you secretly love that I would be like, no fucking way, no way you love that. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, the best part of it is probably like the satisfaction of getting the last aesthetic shot of cutting it open. Yeah. That is actually like, because you're done. In yeah. that moment when you're just breaking the jacket and get to dismember it, that's like, okay, cool. The video's finished. This is incredible. The one I hate the most is like, the i'm eating it and i'm like mm, this is really amazing <laughs> of course it's amazing but like part of the video is also the really like exaggerated reactions to what i'm eating um so that bit is like oh, you're sweating because it's like three minutes of like reactions to what you've you've already eaten most probably yeah. so um, so yeah i'm just well, giving away all, so, the, all yeah, the magic yeah, yeah. All, 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 all the romance of it is gone <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i mean um yeah i mean that entire that entire process i'm always curious about the question that i always think about is what percentage of them actually taste good you know if you're like whoa 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 bro are you doubting me right now hold on a second mate this is talking a bit of an ugly term my friend <laughs> are you doubting that you my food tastes good and now this stands up and walks out of the interview <laughs> i'm like what no, no. it's 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 I won't, I won't film it. I, so there's been times where I filmed it and it hasn't worked out. And then I, I had to film the next day. That's frustrating yeah. when it's been like, when it's like, uh, you have this idea of a recipe in your head, especially the fusion stuff. And then it doesn't turn out. And then you have to keep filming until you mastered it. Keep filming until you mastered it. I did a layered cake and an Indian layered cake. It took me 10 days to get right. And that was frustrating. So um, <laughs> yeah, food tastes good, bro. You have to come over and then yeah, we'll, yeah. Okay, boom, right. you try it. We'll get the real reaction behind it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so part of matbakh is we always like to ask you to pick one dish or ingredient or recipe. And I was thrilled to hear you choose what you did choose. Um, tell us about your choice. Cool. So Salah's meats, or Laham Salah, we called it when we were growing up, is actually my Yemeni for the Miami family it refers to a dish in which my grandmother, who was Indonesian but spoke Arabic, um, she had this dish called salazmi. And I grew up call, calling it salazmi. And like Salah is my father's brother, by the way, so my uncle. And you grow up most of your life just thinking salazmi. We call it salazmi. And to describe it to you, it's like cubes of meat, potato, various vegetables cut in perfect cubes. And it's got this sweet soy. It's very earthy. It's more sweet than it is chili, um, um, but it's incredibly delicious. In fact, it's one of the family's favorite. Everyone that comes and tries it loves it. And you know, I'm I'm growing up, and I guess to the point where I'm like speaking to some other Yemeni friends of mine, and I'm describing this dish because I have no idea what it's called in Arabic. We just call it salaz meat, and they're like, "This isn't a Yemeni dish, bro. We have no idea what this is." And I'm like, I'm like, huh? Then I go back to my family and i'm like why is this called salah's meat and everyone's just kind of like oh, your grandmother used to make it and salah loved it so we called it salah's meat and i'm like huh i go to my auntie and she basically tells me that it was a dish that my indonesian grandmother used to make um, um and it was an indonesian dish and i was like oh snap i was like that's crazy and i was like what was it called and and no one, no one could say anything. No one could, could really remember the original name of the dish. And then I probe into that and the story of my grandmother. And my grandmother was very like strong, powerful woman. Like had seen, had been through stuff, Japanese occupation, Dutch colonialism. Like she, she fled Indonesia and it was incredibly traumatic. Brothers passed away. It was very difficult. And she didn't really talk about it at all, really. So there was these Indonesian things about my family. And then suddenly all, start becoming very apparent to me these traditions were becoming more apparent and basically what she had cooked was this it was called asam daging which basically means like a tamarind beef dish it's like a tamarind sweet soy dish and we're having it in east africa in a yemeni house and then it just blew my mind that like my grandmother had learned things in her formative years in indonesia when she fled literally with nothing because she was fleeing persecution 
because she was, you know, part of a very, you know, the, a certain class in Indonesia that were targeted, um, fled with nothing, um, lost, boat capsizes, by the way. She ends up being like um, rescued on a rescue boat, gets put into East Africa in, in, in Mombasa, sees my dad, they fall, my granddad, they fall in love. Um, he's actually originally has an arranged marriage to a girl he's never met, goes to his family and is like, no. I met this incredible, beautiful girl, ends up marrying my grandmother. She stays in East Africa for the rest of her life, right? So she took nothing. She had nothing with her except the memories and the food that she brought with her. But it was so far removed that the names of these dishes were even forgotten. And it lived on as Salah's meat. And then I go back to Indonesia and I find this dish and it blows my freaking mind. I'm like, I know these flavors. These are exactly the flavors of Salah's meats. And when I was 18, my first tr solo trip to Indonesia, and I'm in this kampong or this village somewhere, and I try this dish, and I'm like, this, we have this, like, literally in my house, and it blows my mind, bro. And it's like this circular migration story of war, fleeing, migration, you know, conflicted identity, not truly knowing who you are, having it go full circle from, like, Warfront, Indonesia, East Africa, Yemen, UK, back to Indonesia, to the same flavors. And this is why I love this term that I'm calling right now, like fluency and flavor. That so much has been lost culturally, linguistically, traditionally, but these flavors are literally like coded DNA of who we are. And like, I could taste it, couldn't understand. We, I didn't have a word for it. I didn't have like a reference for it, but I could taste it. And, you know, we talk about the vehicles into who we are. Yes, language, but food also is a deeply, deeply nuanced and um, powerful means for us to connect with who we are. And I had a, I had a moment like that with Salah's meat, which I know what it is now. And um, yeah, and for me, that's a, a really powerful moment in which a dish blew my mind and gave me a greater sense of who I am. What a story. Holy crap. That's amazing. Wild, bro. Wild. The, re the, the real question. When you tried it in Indonesia, was it better than the one you grew up eating? <laughs> it was, it was, it was <laughs> the one in Indonesia. Thing is, my grandmother passed away when I was young. So I haven't had that one in a very long time. So the one I have is like aberrations from my, my dad, who was not as good a cook as my, my grandmother, who was amazing. Oh, you put me in a hard place, bro. It was different, I'll say. Blame, it, Indonesia, on, blame it on your pops. But yeah, exactly. But the difference, but the difference is interesting also because my grandmother has started putting East African things in the dish, right? We talk about like an amalgamation of cultures as we progress and we move and we migrate and children of diaspora, but food does that as well. It's literally a reflection of like who we are. There's plantains in the dish. There's like things that you find in like East African farms. Yeah. But the flavors, the like the core is still there but it's been embellished with like new influences and new references. And that's what I mean. Like when we talk about like food, having a real, real reflective quality about who we are. And that's why we need to start seeing it in that way, because a lot of us are just kind of like passively ignoring what this food means. Like, and really we should see it as kind of a cipher. Really, if you want to learn about who you are, really like start trying to unpack this Rubik's cube of, of identity through food. Yeah. What was the name of it when you actually found it? I, 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 some dagging. It was like, uh, yeah. it was like, a, like a tamarind, a tamarind beef. Amazing. It was uh, incredible, bro. Totally. Okay. Before we do the quick Q and A, I want to ask you, I want to put you on the spot. If there are like a few dishes that, that can be found in the Yemeni, in the Yemeni restaurants. Sure. What are the few dishes that you're like, you should try these at least four or five dishes that will introduce you to the flavor palette of Yemeni food? Like, you got to try these five. What would Absolutely. they Absolutely. Oof, gosh. Okay, so caveat, Yemen is a big place. Culturally, has very different references. Yeah. So if we want to say five dishes that are relative to me, and my family are Yemeni Hadrami, so we're southern, southern Yemeni. Um, the dishes that I would say are indicative of my identity would be definitely my favorite. Number one is Zorbian. Zorbian, actually, the genesis of Zorbian is actually from 
the trade between South Asia and India specifically, bringing kind of biryani flavors and it amalgamated into this Yemeni version of the dish. Zurbiyan, I would say, was probably Mendi. You have to, but it's a classic. Mendi is a classic. Um, Fette, which is like, you know, we have this kind of cream slash bread slash bread and honey that's kind of mixed in a... It's like, a, you know, in the UK, we have eaten mess, but it's like a Yemeni version of that. It's just a, all the it comforting. Sounds like, it sounds like the Greek fetta. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of. It's just like mashed up basically um, bread and honey and cream, ishtar, and they mix it together and some black habasoda seeds. And like, it's just simple and hearty. Another thing you have to try is probably like the relishes as well, which are really important in terms of any rice dishes in Yemen. So you have... Um, uh, Zahawig, we call it, which is like a basically a green salsa, and it you will have like huge plates of rice dish, like a zorbian or a mendi, and then you would have these relishes on the side, and zahawig is like a green chili coriander mint, refreshing um, little kick to the spices, and it just elevates everything with it. Last but not least, I would have to say most probably. Something I had really recently that I was just obsessed with and I'm trying to cook it, but I can't get it right, is acid or acida. We it was basically like um dough which is pounded continually to the point where it's got this, this like um gelatinous, is that the right word for it? But it's really soft, flowery texture mm. to it. And it's cool. mixed with like date puree and it's just amazing. It's incredible. That would be a good place to start. Amazing. All right, let's do the quick QA, then we will wrap it up. All right. The first question is. What are you reading or watching these days? Um, I'm reading this amazing book that I'm totally obsessed, obsessed about right now. It's like stunning. It's actually one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. You know, one of those books where you just want to underline the whole thing. It's called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. Um, it's done by Rick Rubin. But it really like, it's as a creative, it really gets you to really, really reframe your approach to creativity as a whole. Um, Rick Rubin of like hip hop fame. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Nice. Yeah. It's a it's a stunning book. It, it's like just g- genuinely one of the most beautiful things I've read in a while. Why? It's also like looking at creativity as a spiritual process um, and reframing our relationship with it. And we're all we're all creative, and that's what he tries to get people to understand is that like um, being creative is a state of being as opposed to an output or a product. And I think once you reframe that, you realize that life is a creative act. And actually, spiritually, there's a real closeness to like a God, if you believe in one, or a, a divine being or a universal power. Really, how you can define that is like a state of creation, right? Whatever created us is was a creative act. And really, by you tapping into your creative potential is aligning yourself with that spiritual energy. Um, it sounds really hippie, but you have to read it. It's incredible. He's yeah. an incredible author. Um, it's called The Creative Act by Rick cool. Rubin. It's, it's stunning. It's a beautiful copy table book as well. Amazing. Cool. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Oh, this is a hard one. Shadow Auntie Bourdain. Come on, man. Just in terms of consistency and like synergy, I feel like yeah. I feel like I would show him some serious spots in the Middle East. Guys like been what? to like Lebanon, like you know, like and he's been to like some other place in like Morocco. But I'm like I feel like his Middle East segments were like really like basic. And I kind of feel like I would like kind of take him on the best tour around the Middle East. Cause I used to, I, I lived in the Middle East for four or five years. It's a big part of my life. I go three times a year. So I, I feel that. like. What a hot take. <laughs> right. I'd be like, bro, let me show you around. <laughs> Let's do this right. <laughs> what a hot take. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, you're not that good at traveling. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like the, I feel like the Middle East got those short end of the stick with where they yeah, travels. So like that's it. hilarious. All right. Yeah. Um, what's your guilty pleasure midnight food choice? Guilty midnight food choice is peanut butter, bro. Oh, peanut butter. Listen to me. Hold on. Chunky, a second, right? chunky or smooth? It has to be chunky. What heathen has smooth? Why are you like three years old? That's yeah. crazy. Mikey, you're you're a smooth guy, isn't it? You're you're a smooth. <laughs> no, no, dude, no. I knew it. I can tell from the moment I met you, you're a smooth guy. You're a smooth operator. <laughs> I'm a bit chunky. I'm, I'm a bit rough around the edges. <laughs> I love it. No, oh, it's so funny. no, but listen but, to me. Listen to me. This is a hack, a really quick hack. Get some midgetal dates, mm. kind of open it, seed out, peanut butter inside, change your life. You're welcome. Mm. 
dangerous. Mm. That type of stuff needs a marathon to, to, to get that out. Oh my or, God, that's so good. Or t- tahini and date syrup also. My God, game changer. It's like Nutella with less guilt. It's insane. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, last one. What dish reminds you most of home? What dish reminds me most of home? The thing is, I'm the one, I'm the one cooking the good food in the home. I'm just making sure my mom can't hear me. <laughs> but but um, so like I guess it's whatever I'm cooking. <laughs> what dish? Shot, shots me? fired at your dad, your mom, <laughs> Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> uh, the best the dish that reminds me most of home would have to be probably uh, Nihari. Nihari is actually a Pakistani dish. It's incredible. It's one of the best things I've ever tasted in my life. My grandma on my on my maternal side used to make it for me. It's a slow cooked broth in lots of earthy spices. Literally, it's cooked for about seven hours, and it's like the beef tears apart. It's a little bit spicy. You have it with some fresh naan. Game changer. I love it. Um, Nada, you're so much fun to talk to. I can't I can't wait to come to London and, and hold you. <laughs> Accountable. No, for sure, bro. Anytime. Hello, Sata. You're most welcome. Anyone who's just listening to the podcast, you can find that at um, everywhere. N a d i r n h n a h d i on everything. Um, Nadir, thanks so much, man, for doing this. It's a pleasure you to too. talk to you. And See you later. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Of course. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm.